Hi. Thanks for tuning in to this Pride Month talk. My name is Dr. Veronica Blows, and I'm the least distinguished drag queen in Pittsburgh. And I'm here to share some ideas with you. I'd like to think I'm an expert on queer cultural happenings, but don't take my word for it. Let's dive right in. Let me start with an anecdote. Years ago, back in 2004, when Pittsburgh Pride was still held on the North Shore, I remember seeing a team of drag queen impersonators of Cher, wearing leather or pleather jackets, fishnet body suits, um, and a mountain of black curly hair on their head. Uh, they were performing to Cher's hit song, If I Could Turn Back Time, um, and me, being a little baby gay at the time, was struck by the ritual homage of a gay icon, a diva. And now in 2021, I think about how we almost expect to see a diva rendition in drag at our local pride celebrations. In fact, I'd almost feel cheated if I didn't see a drag queen impersonator of Beyonce doing a backflip on stage. Now, inevitably during Pride Month, you might encounter some great divas on a pre-made Pride playlist on Spotify, or hear someone blasting Diana Ross's I'm Coming Out, or a song by Madonna, or Whitney Houston, Cher, or any other great female singer in the pantheon of divas. But why? What's the connection here? Not all divas identify as LGBTQ. So why are these larger-than-life performers divas, and certain divas particularly, so heavily associated with gay or queer culture? These are just some of the questions we'll be exploring for the next 20 minutes or so in this Pride Month lecture. So sit back, relax, tune yourself into the frequency of divas, and enjoy my multiple outfit changes along the way. Well, hello. Have you ever noticed that a lot of gay men seem to love divas? Have you ever wondered why? Well, I have a theory. The almost zealous love of divas in gay, queer culture is casually referred to as diva worship. So what is diva worship? I'll spare you a lengthy psychoanalytic discussion about how identification or cross-identification works, and instead just tell you what diva worship might look like. Well, for starters, drag gives us one example of the queer appreciation of divas, and it's maybe the most obvious example. Think about how drag queens perform as and engage with all kinds of divas. Um, divas of TV, movies, uh, Broadway, pop music, divas of both past and present. We somewhat expect drag performers to be or have divas as a key aesthetic reference. Um, but also think about the gay men who obsessively collect Britney memorabilia or who immediately learn the choreography to the dancing in a new Lady Gaga music video, or who engage in social media debates about uh, which precise Beyonce album was the most innovative. Uh, those who maybe go into debt to see Madonna in concert one last time, um, or wait outside the stage door of the Roseland Ballroom in the hopes of exchanging a few words with the legendary Grace Jones. Each of these things we can read as acts of diva worship, where the diva's effects, her artistry, uh, her physical presence is a boon and a blessing to those who listen. And it's not just fandom. It's an altogether more impassioned experience, a devotion. It takes on a nearly spiritual quality. Grace Jones, uh, for instance, when she was interviewed um, in the short-lived uh, TV series Andy Warhol's 15 Minutes, uh, she said that 
When people love you and they idolize you, they want to follow you to the ends of the earth. And uh, thinking about that, this tells us that divas like Grace Jones have an immense power to shape the queer folk who seek them out. Now, interestingly, the etymology of the word diva, per the Oxford English Dictionary, reveals to us that diva comes from the Latin, referring to a goddess, or uh, relatedly divus, uh, the feminine form of the divine. So maybe this spiritual, sacred devotion to divas makes sense. Hence, diva worship. Now, I want to add a caveat that some lesbians, trans persons, and other queer folk beyond just gay men also love and have important relationships with divas. Though diva worship as a cultural practice is very commonly and very publicly associated with gay men, as a for instance of how gay men do not own the phenomenon of diva worship, uh, look to the early 20th century uh, when urban working class lesbians were often just as enthralled with opera singers uh, as gay or queer men were. Um, similarly, the great American author Willa Cather was famously enamored with the great opera singer Olive Fremstad. Uh, and she wrote a novel fictionalizing Fremstad's rise to artistic success. Most of the time, though, the love of divas in diva worship is less of a crush and more of a model for how to live one's life. For example, think about how we live in a world where homophobia puts down the feminine parts of young men who are often told to man up, stop crying, and are chastised for playing with dolls or Barbies or makeup. Well, what's a young queer to do then when anything seen as feminine brings social punishment or even violence? Well, to these young queers, divas offer a way to configure femininity, not as something to be ashamed of, but as something powerful and strong. To say it another way, diva worship is never solely an act of adoration. Rather, it is often a powerful act of becoming. Becoming what, you might ask? Well, for me at least, diva worship was an act of becoming queer. I knew that my love of divas marked me as different from heterosexual men. And this same love of divas also made that same feeling of difference a little bit less scary and a little bit more exciting. Divas opened up possibilities for who I might become. So what makes a diva? How have past divas remained in our cultural landscape? Well, for starters, divas seem to have that magnetic je ne sais quoi, which grabs and holds one's attention. Why do so many queer folk remember the wild stories of Grace Jones dancing at Studio 54 during the height of the disco era, yet have a foggier memory of someone like Melanie Safka who became famous among the flower children during the Woodstock era. Now, Melanie Safka was a vastly more successful recording artist, but the afterlife and influence of Grace Jones seems to have far surpassed her in the ensuing decades. This tells us that commercial popularity reveals very little about who counts as a diva and suggests that maybe we ought to look performer's legacy instead. In this way, part of the reason why we remember certain divas is because audiences, and queer audiences particularly, still look to them as figures who inspire self-discovery or self-awareness. We know we're dealing with a diva when we're still talking about her years later, referring to this or that performance or this particularly special live recording, or that one outfit she wore to that one awards show. Or even without all the specifics, some divas are simply loved for generations, and no one can really articulate why, except that we know to love them. Divas are larger than life. 
a diva fills up a venue, big or small, with her presence. A diva becomes sublime when she finds her place on stage. Everyone and everything else around her seems smaller and insignificant in comparison. People gasp, shriek, they scream when they realize they're 10 feet away from a diva like Beyonce. It seems impossible to be so close to someone so grand and radiant. Divas are women of exceptional talent. Though some particularly flamboyant men or genderqueer folk might rightfully be divas too. Take Elton John um, or Prince, for instance. Um, and it's often this exceptional quality, this virtuosity, that makes them seem quite eccentric, or dare I say, queer. Let's consider the title of Cyndi Lauper's 1983 debut album, She Is So Unusual. Now this is more than a catchy title. It actually reveals how we expect our divas to be strange or queer. There's something in the personal history of the diva, in her gesture, in her stage presence, in her training, that always marks her as somewhat unusual. Which is to say, even if a particular diva is heterosexual, there's still something queer about her. Divas are queer because they sow the seeds of queerness in the world. Divas are invariably complicated figures uh, who wear their bodies in exceptional and unpredictable ways. Divas keep us guessing. We never know what they're going to do next. Divas also shape the landscape itself and the way we understand and remember places. Take, for instance, the late, great Tejana diva Selena Quintanilla. Even after Selena's death, a phenomenon of devotion to her continues, such that Selena becomes part of the region's cultural iconography. Or any mention of the quintessential country diva, Dolly Parton, inevitably makes me think of the Great Smoky Mountains, or maybe even the Grand Ole Opry in Nashville, Tennessee. Similarly, it's hard to imagine a discussion of Gertrude Ma Rainey, the mother of the blues, without also thinking about how her performances of the classic blues were deeply tied to a black Southern sensibility. Her life as a touring blues artist and recording artist shaped the culture of the rural South and urban cities of the Midwest. She was also importantly a queer black woman Divas have a life and cultural presence that shapes communities and audiences long after they can no longer perform on stage. This is what divas do. They leave an impression, a mark, on a public. Sometimes that impression or mark is gentle, like a kiss, or a gesture of joy uh, and frivolity that you can hang on to. Other times, that impression is a roar, a call to be defiant and strange. Now, this might all sound a little big, and you might be wondering, but what are the actual things divas have done to merit such a devotion? Well, let's run through a few greatest hits of the things that divas do that tend to earn our love and adoration. Though, don't come for me if I wasn't able to include one of your favorites. Now, for starters, divas are known for their stage theatrics. They know how to make an entrance and an exit. And sometimes, they do something outrageous right in the middle of a show. Let's start with Ma Rainey, the mother of the blues. In the 1920s, she used to emerge from the stage, spinning out of a giant record player, to uproarious cheers and applause. We tend to think of these high production value stage tactics as a contemporary practice, but divas have known how to make an entrance for 100 years or more. Think too about Diana Ross during the halftime show of Super Bowl XXX, where in true diva fashion, she ended her performance by getting into a helicopter and flying away, while still singing. The Super Bowl was a heavily straight affair, so I'm glad Diana Ross added a splash of diva-esque glamour to the big game. 
In a 1978 performance at the legendary Roseland Ballroom, Grace Jones was dressed in a tiger-striped catsuit, and she taunts and roars at an actual tiger caged on stage. After a stage blackout, a puff of smoke, and a sampled sound of a tiger's roar, the lights come up to reveal Grace Jones herself now inside the tiger's cage, licking her lips and taking the tiger's place within the cage. Divas also know their audience. The great body diva, Bette Midler, earned the loving nickname Bathhouse Betty because she seasoned herself as a performer in the late 1960s and early 1970s singing poolside at the Continental Baths in New York City, where gay men would go to meet. And here's an instance of Kylie Minogue in the now-closed Splash Gay Bar in New York City, singing her little heart out next to boy dancers. Divas love the gays who love them back. And divas always come back to us. In the immortal words of Gloria Gaynor, I never can say goodbye. Cher and Barbara Streisand each had farewell tours more than a decade ago, but inexplicably have had several more tours after that, seeming to keep the farewell never-ending. Though diva aficionados aren't really complaining, it seems like we can't let go either. Perhaps it's an overly bold statement, but I honestly don't believe we could have drag queens without divas. Who else would drag queens turn to for inspiration were it not for divas? Now, I'm not claiming that all drag queens are impersonators of divas. Watching a drag show doesn't usually consist of a lineup of Patti LaBelle, Judy Garland, and Gloria Estefan lookalikes. So now that you mention it, I'm going to write that idea down. Patty, Judy, Gloria, one snatch game to rule them all. But drag queens often think of the divas that they're drawn to or idolize and try to emulate them on stage. Take me, for instance. I often look to Australian pop diva Kylie Minogue and I model my own drag persona off of her effortlessly carefree, warm, campy goofiness. Other queens might turn to Grace Jones as a model for a kind of bold, in-your-face, avant-garde uniqueness. Still more queens with a talent for choreography might look to Janet Jackson or Britney Spears as an example for how to entertain an audience with an impressive dance routine. Divas provide a general map for the way a drag queen might style herself, hold herself, move herself on stage, and entertain a crowd. Though as it pertains to drag queen impersonators of divas, it's an altogether more specific craft. Even if a drag queen's skills at hair, makeup, and sewing prevents her from looking exactly like the diva she's impersonating, um, her goal is still to convey the essence of that diva. Whenever I would prepare for performances where I'd be impersonating a diva, I learned to mimic diva gestures, their catchphrases, snarls of the lip, and improbable hairdos. Um, I would study the way that Judy Garland holds her face while belting out a note mid-song. How Cher flicks her hair and licks her lips almost compulsively while nervously posing on stage. Uh, the brassy, almost robotic movements of Ethel Merman. Uh, the earnestly wacky microphone banter of Celine Dion. Uh, or um, the precise mime-like facial gestures of Kate Bush as she's flailing her arms and legs. Speaking for myself here, though I imagine other drag queens feel the same way, my drag practice and my fondness for divas are caught in the symbiotic loop of love. Looking at drag's relationship to diva worship reveals the extent to which divas can pull people in 
to new understandings of embodiment and queerness. It certainly did for me. After all, who can resist when the diva gestures to you? Exploring divas through drag gave me the opportunity to become someone I never would have otherwise thought possible. A tacky, overeducated drag queen in Pittsburgh. And at least part of the love that gay bar audiences have for their local drag queens are seeing them perform and interpret their own favorite divas. Think about how much louder a proud Celine Dion fan might cheer if they witnessed a drag queen absolutely nailing a rendition of It's All Coming Back to Me Now. It might be a good performance on its own, sure, but the recognition of the diva, of your diva, is what makes your response move from enthusiasm to fanaticism. I hope that this framework I've offered for thinking about divas might help you all understand your own divas in better ways. By which I mean to say, ask yourselves, when did your diva or divas become almost sacred to you? What did your love of this diva or divas create? Did it create any affinities and connections in your community? Or did it create a new understanding of yourself or your body? Divas have been with gay or queer culture all along, and it just seems like one can't do without the other. A more highfalutin, academic way to say that is that there is a co-constitutive relationship between divas and queerness itself. Divas inhabit the cultural margins, the after hours, the underground, the outdated, the overlooked places where queer folk seek something sublime and find divas there. Queer folk look to the exuberance of the diva for a pick-me-up in their everyday lives, or for an example of how to live openly and unapologetically amidst pain or tragedy. And divas need an audience of queer folk who aren't afraid to let loose, or clap until their hands hurt, or even impersonate them at the local gay bar. Queer folk let divas know that their message is being heard and embodied. And that message is simple. Be bold. Be bold in the way that you inhabit your body and be bold in the way that you hold yourself up in the world. So during Pride Month, think about one of your favorite divas of past or present. Think about how and when you first encountered this diva. Was it on the radio? Did you watch a music video in a big group of friends? But maybe this process of finding our divas is not wholly a process of our choosing. Sometimes it seems as though our divas find us and that divas play an active role in cultivating queer feelings in ourselves. Now that's something I can be proud of. So here's my homework to all of you. To honor your favorite diva, pull up a playlist on a streaming app or a few music videos on YouTube. Give that diva a listen. Get lost in the song and performance. Grab a lace shawl and twirl around your living room to Stevie Nicks. Uh, sing at the top of your lungs to Whitney Houston's I Want to Dance with Somebody right now. Think about what divas ask of you. Divas beckon to us seeming to say, come with me. Go ahead, follow them. A fabulous life awaits. <laughs>